this upcoming panel on data and democracy um, with the much hyped Census 2020 presentation as well, um, is moderated by Susan McGregor, um, assistant professor uh, at uh, the Columbia Journalism School and assistant director at the Tao Center for Digital Journalism. Um, I will give brief highlights from her bio and it will make complete sense, um, obviously. Um, there she uh, helps supervise the dual degree program in journalism and computer science. Um, she teaches on data journalism, information visualization, algorithms, and ethics, and her work is on information security, privacy, and novel news distribution methods. Um, with that, I will ask Susan to join us and introduce um, our next panel of speakers. Hi, everyone. Our first presentation is going to kind of explore what we mean by data and what we mean by democracy and some of the inherent um, values um, and assumptions that are built into those terms and really kind of offer a clarifying overview in, in uh, opening up those terms um, for discussion and examination. Um, and then um, our second presentation, and I'll introduce each of the speakers before they come up, um, our second presentation is going to look at what it takes to govern, what the, the effort that is involved in attempting to govern existing systems, so looking at existing automated decision-making systems, um, and what the real cost of those is. Very often they're presented as a way to streamline um, uh, decision-making, to decrease costs, to increase efficiency, um, but the attempt to govern them effectively um, actually generates an entire uh, uh, many, many layers of additional work and effort um, to make that happen. Um, and then our third uh, speaker uh, is actually coming from um, a great set of projects that's looking at what does it mean to actually bring participation and governance into the development of these systems. So rather than trying to impose after the fact, what might it look like if we actually engage communities in uh, making choices um, and set and just determining the governance rules um, for how uh, automated decision making systems uh, affect them and how they uh, they engage with the community? Um, so it is my great honor to present our first speaker. Uh, Renee Sieber is a professor of geography and environment at McGill University in Montreal. Um, she's affiliated with McGill School of Computer Science and their Digital Humanities Working Group, as well as the Global Environmental and Climate Change Center of Quebec. Um, she works at the intersection of social theory and computer code and specializes in use of, of information technology by marginalized communities, community-based organizations, and social movement groups. Public participation, she also works with public participation in GIS, I'm sure everyone here knows GIS, uh, Geographical Information Systems, um, and Participatory GeoWeb, um, and its relationship to the environmental movement, development of e-commerce tools, um, and their use in marginalized communities. So with that, Professor Uh So I'm going to talk about um, civic participation with tech, data, and algorithms make the decisions. I'm not a big fan of the concept of data, first of all, because uh, data isn't power. Power is power. Um, it really is the treatment of data. It's whose treatment is valued and whose treatment is not valued. Um, so I'm going to talk about civic participation here, but really it is what is the role of human beings in automated decision making or in automated democracy. Um, that being said, humans are used a lot in automated decision making and in artificial intelligence and algorithms which form the basis of automated decision making, uh, but they serve as uh, contributors of data or proofers of data, think CAPTCHA for example, so they're, they're validating the data. Can it be more than that? Can it be counter mapping? Can it be counter AI and counter algorithms? And I think it can be. Um, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, so I want to go back to the beginning. I'm best known for public participation GIS. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. <laughs> Um, so uh, this is grassroots groups advocating for social change, and this was a long time ago in the mid-90s before GIS was easy to use. Um, I think it's important here to say that um, 
uh, it's, first of all, it's deliberative, and most of the data we're talking about is passive repurposing of ubiquitous and pervasive surveillance. And we need to bring back this notion that people are contributing data deliberately and they know the purpose for which the data is used. Secondly, um, a lot of the stuff I worked in is activist, it's normative, hence the countermapping, it's not descriptive. I think it is important to, um, to decide which side of the line we're on. And are we on the side of goodness or are we on the side of evil? Are we on the side of merely describing what's going on and reacting to what's going on, or are we change agents ourselves? And that really, for those of us who are in academia, uh, is really challenging, but I think the time has come when we have to try to put a stop to some things and we have to empower where we can. <clears throat> um, I think, um, so a lot of what I do is mapping, but I just wanna say that for me, mapping is more than just the visual. Um, sometimes you have to reach deep into the software architecture. This is an uh, ongoing project I've had with the Cree people of, um, in northern Quebec. Uh, this is a geospatial ontology. Uh, well, I won't go into the details of that, but um, you know, when, you, when I talk about, oh, indigenous people, and when I talk about the semantic arrangements, the way that we conceptualize space, you probably think, first of all, you're gonna see the visual, or if you see something structural like this of the arrangement of features, you're probably gonna see me describe stuff about rivers or things about the land or hunting. But we have to reach even further into what are called upper level computational ontologies where, for example, there is no universal way to describe space. We have to accept that even though Web 3.0, um, the semantic web, assumes that everything is interoperability, interoperable. Maybe we have to fight interoperability to challenge it at least. <clears throat> Second of all, um, the way that we have historically in geographic information science defined these distinctions is we sometimes fix geographies or features like mountains and space and time. And the Cree people identified that you, geographic features cannot exist without time. And more importantly, space and time have agency. So actually with the Cree people, time is speaking to them. When, they, when we say that there's such a thing as a living past, that is not merely metaphorical or rhetorical. It actually means that time is telling the future where to go. And that really disturbs our notion of, no, 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 that's spiritual and we'll just put that over there and let us just get to the really hard technical good stuff. Uh, this is uh, my work on, um, actually work with Columbia, uh, NASA, Goddard Institute for Space Studies on climate models. Um, it, they're at, these guys are actually working with actual climate models. This is just to push the point that people look at AI as a black box and they say, oh, there's no way that you know marginalized people could ever do this because Frankly, people in government can't do it. So, I mean, they outsource all this stuff. So why, why is it even possible? You just sort of have to react, um, do like risk assessment measures that are big in Canada right now. Uh, but no, if you can get school kids to run actual climate models, and yeah, it breaks all the time, but they still run them, uh, then why can't we build counter AIs? Okay, so um, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm starting with natural language processing um, and feature detection, so I think it's possible. Um, but I wanna conclude my part of this by saying that when we think about the role of technology and the role of data, in digital urbanisms and in democracy, 
Well, we tend to focus down here on the civil society challenges, and that's really important because issues of digital literacy and digital divides and deficits of resources and how you even define the breadth and depth of participation persists no matter what technology you throw at it. So it's not really a technological pro problem even though we think that technology, it's just around the corner, the next technology is gonna fix all the messy democracy that we have and that's not true and we should fight that. It even, well, that puts me in a terrible position because <laughs> I'm actually advocating for the technology. Um, we also have the issue of institutional <laughs> norms, like more data is always bad, better than less data, even if it's biased data. Why is that? Why should we accept that? And um, that um, quantification is unfortunate, but uh, it's necessary. And like I say, just wait for version 2.0 and we'll fix all that. We will grab all that qualitative small data and we will magically transform it into quantitative big data. Um, and that's one of the big challenges with natural language processing and sentiment analysis that we think that we've kind of figured all that out. Um, and also, just as a side, uh, data allows for us to replicate a consensus model of dispute resolution. You know, there are huge value differences in a democracy, and I don't think we should ignore them and assume that uh, we can do audio to digital conversion of public consultation meetings in real time, and therefore, Figure, this is actually happening in, in Montreal where the, they've done that. It's like, oh, we're gonna, we can convert this and we're gonna do a natural language processing and we'll figure out what people want. It's like, no, listen to the people who are in the room with you. You don't need to thread technology on top of it. And um, lastly, that there are uh, structural epistemologies that the data is uh, confounding. Uh, I call the first one uh, the triumph of liberalism, that we, data has allowed incredible individuation of the world. Um, it's both a way to be biased against you personally and to customize your life, to make your life really convenient, and uh, that makes us incredibly isolated, but it also makes it very difficult to collectively organize. And I think that we need to fight, I'm not talking about neoliberalism, I'm talking about fighting liberalism. Um, and um, lastly, I'll leave it with um, this, this um, session is about data and democracy. Um, digital data affords a kind of technocracy. It is important to remember that technocracy is a form of democracy. So it is quite easy for us to say, well, our lives are so complicated and complex, so why don't we just hand it to the experts, this disembodied data treatment, and that will make our lives smoother so we can do other things like spend more time on social media. Um, I think that we have to think about ways that we can engage in extract joy from the messiness and the descent of democracy in the face of the quantification. That's it, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, and now to share with us insight about um, the complexity of governing some of these automated systems, um, Greta Byram uh, reimagines the way that we design, build, control, and govern communication systems. She's the co-director of the Digital Equity Laboratory at the New School in New York City, where, where she builds digital justice through applied research, community projects, and policy strategy. Uh, she also founded the Resilient Communities Program at the New America Foundation, where she brought training, tools, and equipment for storm-hardened storm mesh Wi-Fi to five neighborhoods in New York City's flood plains. Uh, Byron was a 2017 Harvard Loeb Fellow and currently serves on the boards of the New Harmony Earth Sanctuary and the Metro New York Libraries Council.
Thank you, Susan, and thank you so much, Leah, and the organizers. Thank you, Lila, and um, it's great to be here. I am a GSAP grad, and um, back when I was at GSAP about a decade ago, um, I used to talk a lot about how um, technology, communications technology requires infrastructure, and um, GSAP would tell me, like, that's not urban planning. Go over to the Columbia, to the journalism school. Like, you're not talking about planning. And I was like, but it's infrastructure. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about infrastructure today. And that's data infrastructure, but also literal infrastructure. And the title of my talk was that um, the future is already here. It's just um, poorly managed. So I was, of course, thinking about the, um, <laughs> the old quip from, I think it's William Gibson who said, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And I think um, both are true. Um, but yeah, so I think it's like an open question of um, when we really think about what's happening now as, as the development of a new kind of infrastructure, is it possible to build democracy into it? I'm going to ask a lot of questions, and I'm also going to talk about the census, so get ready. <laughs> okay, so starting off, um, this is what the future of infrastructure looks like. Does anybody know what this is? Just shout it out. 5G. 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 I like to call it the fire festival of infrastructure because <laughs> um, it's all hype and no plumbing. Um, it's very literal. Um, so uh, 5G is um, very high bandwidth, short range communications infrastructure, and it involves um, not only um, the development, massive development of um, building out all these small cells, those, those um, rectangles are small cells, um, which have to be extremely dense, so it really only works in urban areas, um, not in rural areas. Um, and also, um, it's really resource intensive, so you're not going to see a lot of 5G development in poorer areas. Um, it also depends on having really good um, underground pipes, like data infrastructure. So again, in places that have been digitally redlined, which is where the, in the industry has not invested in the underlying infrastructure, you're going to have 5G networks, or you won't have 5G networks, you'll have substandard um, infrastructure in those areas. So that's 5G. It's, it basically um, deepens and um, sort of makes material um, a kind of inequity that exists already. And really, if you look at redlining maps from the 50s and then you look at where digital redlining is happening now, it's the same exact map. Um, so we also know about 5G that it feeds um, surveillance capitalism. It's a wide net. It um, basically is a dragnet of all kinds of data. That's license plate readers, facial recognition systems, um, sensors, beacons, basically just a constant hose of data being processed at the edge and sent through um, the 5G systems. Um, happily, that will be concentrated in affluent, um, <laughs> well-resourced areas. Well, it's not happy, but at least um, we're not doubling down on um, some of the surveillance that is already over um, built out in marginalized and poorer areas. Um, so yeah, 5G and the future of data-driven in infrastructure is not just one system, it's a combination of systems, overlapping systems, and really we can't really think about um, each of these in isolation, it's, it's an overlapping sort of um, pattern of, of um, basically data gathering. And by the way, when Sidewalk Labs says they're not going to use the data they're gathering for advertising, um, they are using it for a new company called Replica, which will actually automate the job of urban planners. So look that up. They just did their IPO in September and raised $11 million to automate planning jobs. And that's what they're going to use the data they're gathering in Toronto for. Um, so I just want to say this is basically the, the back end of 5G. So when you have this kind of wide net of data gathering happening in urban areas, um, this is what it looks like on the other side, which is um, the cybernetic city. So you have um, essentially a hose of data. And by the way, um, by 2020, we'll be producing 44 zettabytes of data per day. That is the equivalent of 44 trillion gigabytes of data. 
So just imagine that volume of data. So what do you do with it all? <laughs> and I, I think we have almost reached this point where uh, because we're generating so much data, then we have to like find ways to do things with it. <laughs> so in a way, we're sort of like creating this cycle of demand um, you know, for, for um, data processing products, which, which in the end are algorithms or automated decision-making systems. The cybernetic city, and this is a concept I'll attribute to Rob Goodspeed, um, it's the science of communication and control of an organized system, and the theory is that if you collect enough data and you have a system of, um, it's like an engine, you have con a control loop with sensors that are measuring all the time, and then you have actuators, um, and you're kind of constantly um, using all this data you're gathering to kind of um, tune the system. So the idea is that um, if we are doing that with our so social systems and our culture, that we should be able to kind of like tune um, our culture based on this like constant influx of data that we're pulling in over, over 5G. Um, but yeah, it sort of creates this imperative um, where we think, um, oh, okay, well, we need to do something with all this data, we need to organize our, our, our systems better, um, and then we get into predictive analytics and automated decision-making systems um, and decisions about <laughs> what to do, what to do with the hose of data. Um, and then we get things like this is, this is sort of um, the futuristic cybernetic control room of the future city. Um, and uh, I love the example, I mean, the, the, five, the fire festival analogy is a joke, but it's also real. So in Rio, they built a control center like this that was supposed to kind of control for um, flooding that was happening in informal settlements on the hillsides. And so they were taking all kinds of sensor data and like just trying to fine tune everything from their central control center. But what they didn't do was deal with the plumbing um, that was being built in these informal settlements. So they continued to have Flood, uh, mudslides, um, despite having this kind of like very um, sanitized um, infrastructure in the city. So yeah, we have this this kind of strange feedback loop that's emerging almost by virtue of the fact that we're building this kind of infrastructure. Um, and we also have industry, that is the telecommunications industry and the technology industry seeing a return on investment from surveillance um, and um, basically Capitalism, surveillance capitalism, which I'll attribute also to Shoshana Zuboff, although she also attributes it to many other people. Um, so yeah, this control center mentality, um, you know, it brings us to a point where kind of th we're sort of heading headlong into this future that we're not sure we really want. Um, but what do we do about it? And this is where I think the question of governance comes in and where we get into this problem of you know, do we regulate, do we um, advocate, do we organize, like what's, what's the answer here? Um, and I think a lot of it is just, we don't even realize in some cases what's happening. So I like to, here we are, census. Census 2020, everybody. It's, it's the most boring topic that ever became like a huge part of my life for a year. Um, so, <laughs> but the census is incredibly important. So if I'm sure as planners, you all are aware that the census will decide um, how district lines are drawn in 2020. It'll decide how we're represented in government at every level. And it'll also decide the fate of $800 billion in federal funding that flows through the states and the municipalities. And it's gonna be online for the first time in 2020. So get ready. <laughs> um, and this, this reaction, which is just like somebody's comment in the New York Times, is really typical of like everybody I've talked to. Wait, what? The census can be online. <laughs> Seriously, people think the citizenship question is the biggest thing, but it's gonna be online, and we all know the terrible things that happen online. Um, what are you talking about? And I do return over and over to these words of Donald Rumsfeld. There are the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, and in dealing with the Census Bureau for the last year, there are many unknown unknowns, and they don't like to answer questions. Um, in addition to the census being online for the first time, um, so 80% of households will be asked to respond online, um, and that's, that's, that's the plan. Um, and mind you, 30% of households in the U.S. don't have internet at home, so <laughs> that's where we are. 
Um, in addition to that, the census is integrating uh, machine learning systems for non-response follow-up um, that'll be integrated with GIS and administrative data. And um, they're also going to use, instead of um, paper forms, they're using what they call distributed devices as a, as, a, as a service, which is iPhones being used by canvassers. So imagine what's gonna happen is somebody's gonna knock on people's door with an iPhone and say, like, I'm here from the government um, to ask you some questions. So that's what's happening. And by the way, um, the citizenship question supposedly will not appear, and I say supposedly because they still A-B tested it in June. Um, but what's happening instead is that um, federal agencies are gonna share directly data with the Census Bureau, including the Department of Homeland Security, um, and supposedly they're gonna share sensitive information like alien registration numbers. So we still have a digital divide. And that's the other thing that comes up with the census is that, again, you know, 80% of households being asked to fill it out online first. There will be an um, automated, uh, what's it called, a, a voice response system. So people will be able to also call a number, but 80% will be asked to fill it in online. This is just you know, an example of what the digital divide looks like. It looks like a donut hole, usually. So you see um, those kind of purplish areas. Um, this is actually census data, which is one of the tragedies, is that we'll lose the best data we have on internet adoption, along with um, going, <laughs> going digital. So those kind of purplish areas, um, those are areas where um, 40 to 60 percent of households do not have home internet of any kind, and they tend to be the, the poorer urban areas in addition to um, rural areas, which is usually you hear about the rural areas. Um, so what we're doing at the Digital Equity Lab is that we're working with New York State's library system. So we've developed a curriculum for them, um, helping to train both frontline staff and IT staff to prepare for census. It's, it's sort of the only thing that we could think to do, but that curriculum will be, do, will be uh, ready, I think, in early November. So I can follow up on that. So that's census. <laughs> Hope I didn't bum anybody out too much. Uh, but yeah, I can answer lots of questions about that. Um, meanwhile, we have basically every day um, stories coming out. I'm just gonna name a few things that have been really alarming in the last few weeks. Um, number one, HUD it has a rulemaking being considered right now which would um, protect uh, algorithmic decision-making when it comes to housing um, and make it impossible for people to sue based on discriminatory impact of housing decisions. Um, it would, would protect the IP of technology companies that are producing those algorithms, so they would be completely um, black box. So that's being decided right now, but basically HUD has announced their intention to do that. Um, also, things like <laughs> this tweet from Danny Rivero, who's just some local reporter who looked at the proceedings, like a thousand pages worth of proceedings that were going to go before um, a commission in the city of Miami and discovered that there was a 30-year contract in there on light poles that would have cameras, license plate readers, and flood sensors that they could sell to anybody. So that's public data that they could just, and so they had to postpone the vote because this guy tweeted about it, um, but it's still being considered. A um, Couple other things, um, Amazon Ring, if you guys are watching that, um, they have 400 partnerships with police departments right now, and police departments are um, coaching, or sorry, Amazon is coaching police departments on how to talk to people out of giving up their uh, ring data. Um, and also public funds are being used to pay Amazon um, for, for installation of this equipment. And meanwhile, there's a fight in New York State right now um, over uh, facial recognition technology that's already been introduced by private landlords in the city. So these are all things that are happening right this second. So what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do about all of this? Um, oh yeah, this I forgot about this great example where um, the New York Police Department was using a facial recognition system. They had some grainy video of a guy that stole beer from a bodega and the police officer who was 
looking at the footage, said, oh, I can't really see the guy's face, but he looks like Woody Harrelson. And so they fed Woody Harrelson's image into um, the facial recognition composite system and generated a new image and then arrested somebody based on, um, based on that composite. So that's in a report from the Georgetown Privacy um, Technology Center, um, if you want to check that out. Um, so yeah, what do we do? Um, in 2018, the city of New York, um, the city council passed a law um, setting up, at first it was going to be a commission that would review automated decision-making systems or algorithms used by any city department or agency. Um, and then they decided they weren't ready for that, so instead it became a task force that was going to um, develop a plan for how to do that. Um, and. Basically, that task force has been convening for about a year, and the report is due out in November. Um, but what has happened is that um, the process has gotten, it's sort of turned into like a bleakly bureaucratic <laughs> process. Um, and by that I mean, um, you know, it was, it's, you know, amazing, wonderful leaders who are on the task force, um, leaders in, in data science and um, algorithmic fairness. Um, civil leaders, um, great people from around the city, um, but there was no sort of coherence or like sort of clear directive in the law that city council passed. Um, and so um, they spent a really long time just trying to figure out what an automated decision making is. How do you define it? Um, the law was written so broadly that a calculator would have qualified as an automated decision-making system. And when you have hundreds of ADSs already being rolled out by city departments, just the sheer work of saying this one qualifies as something that needs review, this one doesn't, um, is already a problem. And then you had the problem in addition that many city agencies and departments were not very happy to give up this information about the systems they were using. In particular, the New York Police Department was not. <laughs> um, and then the last problem that they had was um, what um, Albert Kahn of, of STOP, uh, which is a surveillance um, sort of watchdog group in New York, what he calls the salience gap, which is that when you try to hold a public process around something like ADSs and you're like, we're going to have a meeting about ADSs, people are like, you what? <laughs> You're going to do what now? So people um, have a hard time, lawmakers in particular, have a hard time understanding what they're deciding about. Um, so we'll see what happens with the task force's recommendations next month. Um, there's also a group convening, uh, convened right now by the NAACP of New York and the Legal Aid Fund, which is going to hold a convening in early December where they're going to actually hold a discotheque and um, sort of help people understand ADSs and then um, have a kind of organizing push around it. Um, so what can civil society do? If regulation is really hard, <laughs> what can civil society do? I just, I love these folks. This is the Connecticut Four. Does anybody know who the Connecticut Four is? Like, raise your hand. They're like my heroes. No? Okay, too bad. Um, now you know. The Connecticut Four um, was a group of librarians who um, were issued with a demand for um, patrons um, borrowing records under the Patriot Act um, and also a gag order. And so they fought back and they took it all the way to the Supreme Court and they won. Um, so they are amazing and they're librarians and one of the reasons that they uh, protected people's data so um, strongly was due to the ALA code of ethics. So where can we find ethical codes, professional codes like this where um, people feel empowered based on a professional code that they have sworn to um, to uphold uh, the people's privacy and security? Uh, we also need multi-level policy advocacy because one thing we've seen is that these kinds of decisions um, around ADSs tend to be made in court. And so we'll often have um, overlapping jurisdictions or we'll have like a decision made in, in a court where like state policy is actually different. Um, and in the case, the wonderful case where people have come together and organized for facial recognition bans like in Oakland, San Francisco and Somerville. That doesn't stop ICE from using facial recognitions, it, it, recognition in those jurisdictions because those are municipal bans, not federal, right? And then something like the state's housing policy 
Um, even if this, even, even if a judge in Brooklyn says this landlord's not allowed to use a facial recognition system in that building, the state may still have a different policy. So we really need to understand that there's a jurisdictional problem in regulation and start to do advocacy on every level. Um, we also need to do awareness building and education, discotheques everywhere, um, and look to codes and standards um, where they exist. Um, and then I, I want to just also um, shout out um, the work. So this is um, some of the work that we did at New America with the Resilient Communities Project where we developed a kit where people can build their own infrastructure. So this is kind of like the mini version of um, a wireless network. Um, and we've now rolled these kits out all over New York City. Um, and you can sort of mesh them together to kind of do a ground up like DIY network. And the thing that's awesome about this is that people get hands on. And they it sort of demystifies um, networks for people. And you see, you know, whether it's, um, Something that's going to work at scale or like cover the whole city is not really the question. The question is how do people relate to technology? How do they feel about it when it's in their hands and they feel like, oh, I can make this. I'm a producer. Um, and we, um, well, I wear two hats. I, I should have mentioned. So one is I'm the director. Um, I'm the co-director of the Digital Equity Lab at the New School with Maya Wiley. And then the other hat I wear is I'm the director of um, something called Community Tech New York. We are the sister project of Detroit Community Technology Project. Um, and together we, um, we are something called the Community Technology Collective. And we are trying to build a movement. Well, we are building a movement. Um, this is from some work that we did last month in rural Tennessee, building a new network. Um, and I'm really excited that Janice Gates is going to get up next and talk about um, the Equitable Internet Initiative, which we're just like a new piece of it. But um, she'll talk about the history um, and what they're up to now with the Detroit Community Technology Project. So I wanted to leave you all with a little bit of hope um, that we can build something different. Um, and also a note of caution that um, we don't have to rush headlong into this future that's rushing towards us. So thank you. And so as Greta mentioned, um, uh, next up, we have Janice Gates, who is the Director of Programming for the Equitable Internet Initiative at the Detroit Community Technology Project. Um, and she has a background in program management, marketing, public relations, and communications. She works with anchor organizations in uh, three Detroit neighborhoods of Island View Southwest and the North End, seeding community technology programming, including DCTP's Digital Stewards Training Program, local expansion, outreach strategies, partnerships, program implementation, evaluation, and internet adoption. So Janice is going to share with us, um, I think, sort of a vision of an alternative approach to how we might design these systems um, in a participatory way and what that alternate future might look like. Well, thank you, Susan. I'm really grateful to be here with all of you today. Um, really appreciate the shout out, Dr. Benjamin and Greta. Yeah, so today I just want to share with you um, some of the work that we do, um, give you some context, um, talk a little bit about the history, and then tell you why um, we do this work and why we feel um, that it's important. So the Detroit Community Technology Project. Uh, so we use and develop technology that's rooted in community needs and strengthens human connections to each other and the planet. Um, so before I jump into um, what the Equitable Internet Initiative is, um, and EII as I'm going to call it um, moving forward, just want to give you some context. Um, some parts of Detroit are seeing lots of growth and development. Um, but since 2015, Detroit has consistently remained at the top of the list of worst connected cities um, in the country. In addition, 38% um, of homes have no internet connection at all. 63% of homes, of low income homes, have no in home broadband. And then 70% of the school aged children in Detroit have no internet access at home. And the backdrop to all of this is that the median household income is $26,000. $249. So this map shows 
the percentages of homes in the city with no household internet subscriptions. Um, so like Greta mentioned, it's kind of a donut hole effect here. So you'll see the blue areas, and those are, they have the highest percentages of internet access. Um, all of the red, it's about 49 to 87% of homes with no internet. Um, and the orange, 35 to 49%. And the small orange dots that you see are the smaller um, pockets of internet access that exist in the city. So just think about like how often you use your technology, how often um, that you're online, and what your day might be like if you didn't have that opportunity. So if you lived in one of these red areas, your life could be substantially different. So you might not be able to do things like search for and apply for a job, access important government resources and information online, like about local elections and the census, um, and you might not be able to fully participate in an economy that's moving online more and more. Factor into this that you come from a community that's consistently excluded or underrepresented, and you live in a low-income community that has very few resources. And so this is really why we believe that communication is a fundamental human right and in digital equity, and it's also why we created the Equitable Internet Initiative. So as part of this initiative, um, we work with three neighborhoods in Detroit, Southwest, um, Island View, and the North End to build community-governed wireless um, networks, um, otherwise known as ISPs, or internet service providers, to bring their communities online. So just a little bit of the history. We really started talking about this program in 2015, began having conversations around it. 2016, we solidified partnerships with uh, Church of the Messiah in, on the east side, um, the North End Woodward Community Coalition in the North End and Grace in Action um, in Southwest Detroit to launch the program. 2017, we completed um, a training for 45 Detroit residents, 15 in each neighborhood. Um, this was a training where they learned community organizing and wireless engineering skills to build out the network infrastructure. Last year was the pilot year where we connected about 150 homes, um, about 50 in each neighborhood. Um, and this year we really focused on expansion, adoption, sustainability, and resiliency. And these are the things that we prioritize. So homes with no internet connection at all or those who wouldn't otherwise wouldn't be able to have a connection. Um, homes where adults or children are participating in educational programs, um, senior citizens, and our Island View neighborhood has one of the largest concentrations of senior citizens in Detroit, and those living in vulnerable areas um, who ex often experience flooding and things like water um, shutoffs. So what makes us different from a traditional internet service provider is that we practice data justice, and we do so um, by training community technologists, um, having and creating sets of principles, um, trainings, building relationships, and in our policies. So really integral to this work are our digital stewards, and they really build out the network infrastructure. And these stewards are community organizers, they're artists, um, they're educators, their neighborhood leaders, um, they work, they live in the community in which they work, and as you can see, they are people of color because we are challenging this idea that the face of a technologist has to be white. Um, they also range in age from elders to their teens. And we train them as community technologists, and so what that means is that they build technology in a way that heals relationships and helps to restore the neighborhood. And some of the ways that they do this is they're really intentional about how they build, design, and expand the networks. They work with neighborhood advisory councils, and they host participatory design sessions with um, their communities and the people on their network. And then our work is guided by a set of collaboratively designed um, principles. So this is really how we ensure that our networks remain autonomous, and it's how we, um, know that we're really helping those that are the most impacted. These principles guide our work, they guide how we collaborate, and they help to keep us aligned and focused. 
And then training, so last year our stewards went through a three-day intensive training um, led by um, DCTP's um, data justice director um, on digital security, privacy, and consent, where they learned how to think critically about data and privacy, uh, safety versus security, and what that means for their neighborhoods, and how to create best practices um, on securing their network. And we also focus on building relationships. Um, so we don't make assumptions about what's best for our communities. We don't make assumptions about what they need or run into these communities with a list of solutions we think will help them. Uh, we focus on collaboration, engagement, and building relationships that are authentic and transparent. Um, and some of the ways the stewards do this is by initially canvassing their neighborhoods, so literally going door to door um, to talk to people and survey them about internet access. They partner with local businesses and community gathering spaces to help build out the distribution network. Um, and they host trainings um, and workshops in their neighborhood that are focused on adoption and security. The neighborhoods also build relationships with each other. Um, when we pulled these three neighborhoods together in the beginning, they didn't really work together um, a whole lot. Um, but these are some of the ways they share staff. Um, so in cases of steward turnover or if someone goes on leave or a vacation, um, and they share services, resources, and also collaborate on hosting um, trainings and events. We also create a responsible policy. So we don't sell or share data. Um, we practice net neutrality that's written into our agreements. Um, we're transparent about the information that we collect and why. Um, and we have a privacy policy that our stewards actually verbally review with um, a new client. So while we're working um, within EII to create and model this new world we want to see, um, we still have to address the reality of the implementation of harmful technologies into our communities. Um, so where, where we are focused on building relationships, there are technologies being designed every day that inspire fear, suspicion, and surveillance of each other. Um, where we encourage participation and engagement, um, companies are creating technologies that eliminate human involvement altogether, and where we practice consent, um, the gathering, buying, and selling of data without consent has become very lucrative. Um, and these are some of the policies um, that have recently been rolled out in Detroit. Um, the first of which is uh, Project Greenlight, which is a real-time police surveillance camera program that local businesses buy into with the idea in mind that this will keep their neighborhood, keep their businesses safe and will reduce um, crime. Um, since its launch, uh, it's expanded into schools, churches, and affordable housing communities. Another technology is facial recognition. Um, which was just recently um, the Board of Police Commissioners in Detroit um, approved the use of this technology um, in our communities. So the real issue here is that Detroit is still a majority black city, <clears throat> um, and many of the neighborhoods are not experiencing the economic growth and development that others are. These neighborhoods are seeing gentrification, and the implementation of dangerous technologies that are used to surveil them, profile them, and further harm their communities. And so the work of the Detroit Community Technology Project, specifically this data justice work, is um, led by our data justice director. And we also work in coalition with other organizations like the ACLU, um, Georgetown University, BYP 100, uh, Fight for the Future, and fight for the future and others um, to educate the community around these technologies, lead resistance to them, call for moratoriums on facial recognition, um, and calls for responsible governance. And this is really the tension that we and I'm sure other organizations are facing, trying to create um, a world they want to see while also having to still navigate their way through um, harmful systems and infrastructures. That's why we use these two um, approaches, so having resistance within, 
but on the outside, modeling and trying to create the world that we um, want to see. Because we believe that media and technology are really essential to helping transform a community, because they create opportunities for participation, collaboration, access, engagement, particularly for those um, often excluded, like people of color, women, uh, people who identify as LGBTQIA um, and beyond, and pe women and people who identify as women. They also help communities to realize their economic and political power. So outside of this work, in my spare time, I'm an energy healer. And so I think of uh, the process of tearing down these harmful systems like disproving a harmful belief that's had years to percolate. Um, they need to be uprooted, dismantled, and reframed so that new and more participatory systems can take root. And thank you. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for your fantastic presentations. There's, uh, my mind is bursting. I think one of, one of the themes that, that has been addressed here, and, and much of this work is very close to my heart um, in the work that I do around journalism and communications. Um, Janice, I was hoping to start with you, um, because I think uh, one of the... Uh, one of the issues that's been raised is sort of uh, this idea of how do we govern after the fact. And, and a, uh, I, I'm curious that the policies that you all have developed at EII to govern the engagement with communities and the building out of that network, um, <laughs> the, the part of me that wants to quantify is curious, how, how long did it take you to develop those policies to come up with things that you felt were principled enough to, to then you know, give to the digital stewards and say, okay, or give to the communities and say, this is the outline. Yeah, well, so the first um, round of the policy agreements was kind of a, I don't want to say a mad dash, but we were just kind of starting, and we didn't know what we didn't know about how ISPs operate. Mm -hmm. And so we had, one, I think one of our engineers put together um, the policies, but then we had like a, we had at least eight lawyers um, review them, and then we also had uh, the anchor organizations. Each of them went through them, um, and we offered them the opportunity to give uh, feedback for things that they thought should be in there. Um, so we had um, actual conversations about, you know, including net neutrality um, in that space because um, I think it was the year actually that we officially launched EII. Um, net neutrality was overturned. Mm -hmm. um, Yep, so the year after it was um, overturned, and then we also have, like I said, the stewards review the privacy policies verbally um, with the communities, and that's really to just help to build the relationship and to create trust, because these are often people who they haven't had internet access before, especially a senior citizen, and you can't give them a 12-page document and ask them to sign it without um, explaining to them. And so we also wanted to let them know how, so how you would, um, with a traditional ISP, you'd get these policies and they might offer you five or ten dollars a month, which is um, what Comcast and AT&T are trying to offer now mm. in Detroit. But there are all these loopholes in there where they have opportunities to raise these fees mm -hmm. um, and add fees into the contracts. And so we specifically have the stewards do that um, because we want the communities to know that we're not just like trying to make money off of this project because it's actually not you know super profitable um we're trying to bring access and we're trying to stay true to that mission yeah i mean part of the reason why i ask is because um you know i think we think about um i've been following the work of the the uh, ads task force here in new york city and think about how drawn out that process has become and i think one of the things i think about um at this intersection of data and democracy is that um as somebody who I actually many, many years ago studied computer science. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually work with computer scientists. Most of my research uh, is with computer scientists. And, and I always find the contrast between um, engineering and not everything else, but a lot of other practice uh, methods is the desire for engineering to come up with a single solution, right? One solution that applies to everyone and everything. Um, and so I was, I was curious because, again, to contrast with the EDS process, which is trying to 
maybe create a governance or even a definitional structure. But also, um, Greta, in your presentation, you brought up this issue of, well, we, we have these very piecemeal regula regulations. I'm wondering how likely or even appropriate you think it is to have to tr strive for a single governance system, right? Are we would we be over engineering at that point? Because one of the things that strikes me as really uh, significant about the work I think you're doing with EII is that, in principle, the components of the technology are the same, but each network looks different mm -hmm. depending on the needs and interests of the community. And so I'm curious what you think about: is there a balance to strike between? you know, this is the overarching regulation, which to me sounds kind of appealing, but, you know, you sort of see, well, does that mean that we're kind of flattening the ability for a grassroots representation? Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's a, um, it's a really interesting question because we're working now um, with the Community Technology Collective. We're trying to build um, equitable internet initiative projects now in upstate New York and rural Tennessee, which I mentioned. And one of the challenges we're finding is that um, it's really difficult to take all of the policies that work in Detroit and bring them to these other contexts. So for example, in Tennessee, um, we're having a really hard time finding um, what's called a backhaul provider. So somebody that'll provide a data, data source for the Equitable Internet Initiative project there. and we may not be able to bring all of the EII policies and then we'll have to have a, a collective um, retreat probably <laughs> where we um, spend a lot of time just ta you know, talking it out. So yeah, it's a very time intensive process, but I think when it comes to something like um, ADSs and civil liberties, we're talking about something different there. I mean, we're talking about um, civil rights, and in that case, we do need to have a coherent governance structure uh, because it's the Bill of Rights. Um, and, you know, this is the, the nature of our democracy is we have federal, state, and local governance. And if those things are at odds with each other, then how does anybody um, enforce the law? <laughs> and the law right now is the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, knock on wood. So. Um, let's try to agree <laughs> to stick to that <laughs> and, and, and maybe strengthen it where we can. Yeah. So thank you so much. And I, and I think, uh, Renee, this makes me think of, of uh, that wonderful triangle that you, uh, that you showed and this idea of sort of structural uh, epistemologies. Um, is the Bill of Rights where we should start? With that, I mean, if we try to think about these systems and what we are trying to preserve or replicate into the future, um, I, it, it strikes me that at a technical level, this is not at all what these systems do. Um, and uh, but but is that what we does that seem like a sensible place to aspire to? I'm, I'm wondering, and this is really for all of you, you know, where do we begin when we think about what we should be preserving or guaranteeing when we try to. Uh, have these systems in our democracy, or do we exclude them? Are there places where they just don't belong? Uh, I've taught for many years with law scholars, and I've taught law students, and it's made me realize that law isn't everything. <laughs> um, so there, not everything is amenable to being adjudicated as a rights issue as opposed to a norms issue. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, I think, for me, I think we need to start inside uh, governmental organizations. Um, uh, governmental employees are our friends often, mm -hmm. and um, they're as frustrated um, as we are sometimes with the abuse and um, the slowness of government response, although, uh, given that um, participation, uh, participatory democracy is actually enshrined in um, governments as a result of many, many years of pushback in advocating that citizens have standing. Uh, I don't think there's something to be said for the slowness mm -hmm. of government and not to. Um, uh, adopt agile methodology as the way that they approach everything. 
so I'm not entirely sure that it should always be rights-based uh, because, <laughs> so when, we, when I teach with a law scholar and you know, half the class ends up thinking, oh, I'm gonna go into law now because law will solve everything because everyone follows the law, right? It's like, no, they don't. So oftentimes, and you can't legislate everything. Mm -hmm. So I think it really behooves us to think about how we convince or con or something um, government employees. So you see government employees then as, a, as potential partners in, this, in these efforts. Yeah, because there is at a loss as, and as nonprofit organizations. Everything is outsourced. It's sending out RFPs for automated decision uh, making systems. They have no clue what they're getting, so um, we can help them out. Right. Um, I don't know. Would either of you like to add to that in terms of should we be starting with with rights as the as the place for defining these systems? I mean, I, I sort of think at this moment in the United States, I think many of us have learned the hard way over the last several years uh, that norms go quickly uh, in the wrong context. And so I'm wondering if 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 you think establishing the norms is enough or I think they go um, hand in hand. I think. Um, like part of your question was like, what is important to preserve? Mm -hmm. And so for us, that is the relationships, um, that's the history, that's like the culture in the neighborhood, um, and people's privacy. And so in our Southwest network, um, there's a really large Hispanic population, they have a really large um, immig immigrant population. And so with the rollout of technologies like Project Greenlight, it's not only harmful, but it's actually really dangerous. And so we've heard stories of ICE <clears throat> actually sitting outside of some schools. And I had one person tell me that she was waiting for her friend to come to school one day and she just didn't show up because ICE had apparently grabbed her. And so what essentially is happening is that families are being torn apart. So I think like that, like on the ground level, on the very basic level is a place to start, but I also think that the rights the rights and like policy work is important. Yeah. Greta, do you want to add anything? Or? Um, I just uh, the only. I mean, I I think that's right. I think like we we sort of have to um, yeah honor both rights and norms and um, struggle with the problem of 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 how we enforce <laughs> any of that. Um, but to um, uh, to your point about, to Renee's point about um, government employees, I think one of the things that we're seeing um, in a lot of agencies right now is that career folks that have been there forever, um, so this is at the federal level in a lot of cases, they are really struggling with some of the directives that they've been given. And, you know, for example, the Census Bureau has amazing staff who are doing their very best to make this 2020 census um, pan out well, it's not going to. Um, but you see, you know, I'm so grateful that those people are there um, and that they're doing their best to create integrity in the process. So, yeah, I think we're at a really strange point where we have to appeal to maybe um, the norms that exist in, in people's minds or, you know, their, their, the historical memory of of our democracy, um, and and then you know also remember and honor um, local histories and cultures as well. I actually just I I recently at the journalism school I taught a class on algorithms, and um, I just want to encourage anyone who isn't kind of familiar with how machine learning systems work, which is the kind of decision-making systems we're talking about here. There's a wonderful paper by a statistician um, named Galit Shmuley. Um, that was published uh, in 2010, and it's called To Explain or Predict. And um, I, I recommend it because I think it provides one of the most um, clear and compelling uh, explanations of what automated decision-making systems do, uh, which is essentially to replicate the world as it has been delivered to them. Um, and she uses this fantastic analogy between of, of um, Van Gogh's Starry Night, uh, and this idea that you can look at the Starry Night uh, image and say, is this a picture of a real place, and use that image to try to infer what that village actually looked like, 
Or you can look at it and imagine a piece is missing and say, I'm going to look at that painting and try to fill in the blank. And that filling in the blank is what uh, machine learning systems do. They, tr they take the data that they are given, which is the picture of the world that has been fed to them in the form of these data points, and tries to replicate that. And the fact that they're really only capable of positive feedback loops to replicate what they have been fed, um, I think is a really fundamental thing to consider as we think about what these systems are actually capable of doing and whether that uh, uh, resolves with our desire for representation and democracy. So, can I shout out one more well, one yes. more paper on that note? Is mm. um, it's called Dirty Data, and it, it's by Rashida Richardson and yeah. um, her co-authors at AI mm. Now Institute, mm. and um, basically examining predictive policing systems and how um, biased, historically <coughs> biased policing data. Um, has gone into creating these predictive systems that then replicate that bias in their predictions. So that paper came out this Couple year. Of years. I yeah, no, yeah. I think it was, well, yeah. Maybe last year. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Dirty data AI now. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for tying back to the morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> That, I'm going to leave it there. But thank you for tying back to the morning. Uh, part two, I will also tie back um, to the counting and the trucking. Um, just to give you a chance to answer this question for everybody in the room. Given what's written in the Constitution about the decennial census, given that I think you said that any gaps or non-responses, mm -hmm. yeah. with not the gaps produced by non-responses will be filled by machine learning. Is the 2020 U.S. decennial census designed to be an enumeration? <laughs> is it designed to be a count? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's such a good question. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's it. That's the whole question. Right. Yeah. Um, right. So the Constitution mandates that um, the census should be an actual count. So that's the reason that um, whereas the American Community Survey is sample based, um, the decennial census is supposed to be just a straight up count. So um, in order to try to answer that question, I recommend that people read the Census Bureau's operational plan. I'm just kidding. I don't actually <laughs> because I read it. Is there it a quick summary? Almost, uh, but um, no, it's really complicated because the non-response follow-up system, what they actually did was they collected administrative data from every municipality in the country and built an, essentially a very advanced um, mapping system. And yes, it does fill in the blanks, but the blanks it fills in is um, basically given what the composition of X neighborhood is in terms of households, um, then we can impute that Y neighborhood looks like that as well. And then um, that is how the Census Bureau then does the follow-ups that um, will inform the count. So they can sort of say that methodologically it's a count, um, but the way they're designing the system that will follow up and continue to canvas neighborhoods um, is, is, is informed by that machine learning process. I will say they are only planning to, to canvas a quarter of the blocks that they canvassed in 2010. Um, and so, you know, take from that what you will about imputation, right? Um, so I think it's a really complicated answer and I think it, it rests on um, how we understand um, the technical systems behind this. And the final thing I'll say is um, the Government Accountability Office issued 500 flags um, on the Census Bureau systems, many of which have not actually been finished yet, even though we're going into the count um, in March. Um, and basically at this point, the GIO is saying the flags are only going up in number um, and that their major recommendation for the Census Bureau is to create a system to deal with the recommendations. Um, hi, um, I had a question on the census. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so scared. Um, there is a switch to, the, to differential privacy as a way yeah. to protect individual level data. Yeah. which essentially means data reconstruction instead of data re-identification. And I was wondering how that fits in the conversation of data and democracy, if it does. How it fits in with what? In the conversation about data and democracy. And if it does. Um, yeah, so 
differential privacy is another data swapping technique to protect, so to, to prevent re-identification of um, de-identified data. So the Census Bureau recognized that, that um, systems are so advanced now, data processing, that it would be quite easy to re-identify census data um, if they released the raw data as they have in the past. Um, and so they've decided to employ this technique whereby they do sort of the same thing where they swap um, data from one census block for another um, in the official release. So that's what the plan is um, for the release of 2020 data. Of course, that also means if you're gonna do data swapping informed by machine learning, it means um, that you could have a 100% error rate. And then that, when you get into um, districting, that becomes a huge issue. Um, it also means that anybody who's not a huge academic institution or otherwise like very well resourced institution is only going to have data um, that has had this technique applied to it. So, um, how much like how much will we able to be able to actually, you know, rely on the veracity of this data? It's it's really a question and hotly debated among statisticians. I'm not one of those. So. Um, I will give one last plug, which is that here on campus there will be um, there will be an event on the census as well, uh, <laughs> led by a colleague of mine who is a uh, journalism professor and statistician. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, unfortunately, we have to conclude. This has been really wonderful. Thank you all so much for your presentations and participation. Thank you.